Erica. Erica. Oh, there we are. Test one, two. Sounds good. Do you need any more? Is that good for you? All right. Thank you. Good evening, Parkway. It's good to see everybody joining us tonight. Amen. It's good to have everybody here in person, and it's good to have everybody who's joining us via live stream, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and via the conference line. We're glad to have everybody joining us. We'll take you any way we can get you. <laughs> so we're glad to have everybody who's joining us here in person and, and all those who are joining us remotely. And I want to go ahead and say a special thank you to Erica for taking care of our technology tonight. We sure do appreciate her. Amen. And let me go ahead and say thank you to Andrew for serving as our security tonight. We appreciate him. And let's go ahead and say thank you to Joe for teaching tonight ahead of time. Yeah. We appreciate Joe so much, and he is going to come in just a few minutes, and he's also going to share about our special event next Wednesday night, March the 10th. It's going to be uh, wonderful, and uh, I'm looking forward to it so much, and I'm going to let him explain about it and get you up to date on everything you need to know, but uh, next Wednesday night is going to be such a beautiful, wonderful event, and I encourage everybody to join with us, either here in person or join us remotely. So Joe will let you know how to, uh, he'll get you the information you need to know to join us either way. All right, well, it's been a beautiful day, and it's, it's uh, kind of gotten warm. In fact, I'm getting a little warm right now, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, I hope you all have had a wonderful day, and we're going to get started here with prayer in just a moment, uh, but before we do that, uh, let me just invite you also to join us on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. for our Sunday school and at 10.30 a.m. for our worship service. Uh, we are so excited about what God is doing, and we're so glad to be able to come together, amen, and it's uh, such a, a treat for us to get to come together and be the body of Christ in this hour, so thank you all for joining us tonight, and, and uh, please join us on Sunday as well. Okay, uh, 
let me just go ahead and uh, open up with prayer. But before we do that, let's thank the Lord. Amen? Yes. Yes. Walter. Yes. Amen. And we've got a number of other people we're going to lift up in prayer as well. But before we ask God for anything, let's thank him. Amen. Father, we thank you for all of your goodness and mercy and love and all of your grace. We thank you, Father, for giving us breath and life and breath. Thank you, Father, most of all, for sending your son Jesus to be our Savior. And we put our faith and trust and hope in Jesus, afresh and anew tonight. Oh God, it's such an honor and a privilege to be together with our brothers and sisters and to be the body of Christ. And Father, we just thank you for that honor and that privilege that you've given us, adopting us into your royal family and making us heirs with you, heirs of you and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Oh God, what, a, what an honor, what a privilege. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up this time tonight, and we ask that your hand would be upon this time tonight. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would move by your Holy Spirit, and that you would open us up with your word as we open up your word, Father. As Joe comes to teach, put your hand upon him and use him for your glory and for your honor. Cause your word to come alive in us tonight, in Jesus' name. And Father, we also want to lift up the needs that are amongst us, Father. We lift up all those who are in need of a physical touch. Walter Miller, Jamesina Miller, Donna Husky, Homer and Shirley Hampton, Tyann Miller, Don Roberts, John Dean, Corky North, and everyone else who needs a physical touch tonight. Father, we just pray for your healing to be manifested and displayed. You've already done it, Lord. It's a finished work at Calvary, and it's it's already through your son, Jesus Christ. It has already been done, and we thank you for that. By his stripes, we were healed. So, Father, help us to receive your healing. And, Father, we pray that you would manifest your healing in the body of Christ tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And, Father, we just give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And, Father, we just are, are going to be able to say at the end of this time, that surely it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give him praise. Amen. Amen. Well, come right on, Brother Joe, and share with us tonight. We sure do appreciate Joe, don't we? Amen. Come right on. Thank you, Pastor. It's a joy to be here tonight. Welcome, family. Good to see all of you and all of you that are Logging on right now via Parkway, I think Facebook also is broadcasting, and so we're, we're so grateful for all of you coming in. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day where COVID just uh, reduces to nearly nothing so we can all get back together again. And I know uh, it's beginning to happen. I heard today that Texas opened up 100%. Mississippi, I think I heard, opened up. And, and others are beginning to, to move back that way. Hopefully, they'll still use some wisdom when they need to, including masks and social distancing when, it, when it's correct to do that. But I believe God's going to um, just allow us to get open here in Tennessee. I know our COVID numbers are going way down very fast. And, uh, and I, it's just a thrill. I love coming in on Sunday mornings now, and more and more people are coming. And I'm sure you've all noticed with me, so many new faces. I just love it, and I can only assume that these people have been watching via the live stream and, and like what they're seeing, and so they're coming to the house of the Lord, and I believe we're going to be bigger and stronger after COVID than before. You watch. It's going to be amazing. Um, I want to talk to you about next Wednesday. Next Wednesday is going to be an, an, just an incredible event that Pastor and uh, Mark Gerson are going to be hosting right here at Parkway Church of God. Now, Mark Gerson, if you don't know the name, and you probably don't, Mark is a Jewish uh, scholar. He's brilliant. He spends, if I remember right, and he'll probably tell us this uh, live next week. Uh, when I say live, I'm talking through computer. This will be a live stream. Not Mark won't be here, but it'd be live stream. I believe Mark spends about three hours or four hours a day 
in the scriptures. And he's, you can tell when you hear him talk, you'll know that he's a studier. It just comes, it pours out of him. It's just an amazing thing. His wife is a rabbi. Um, they're both brilliant people. Uh, their children are just brilliant kids. In fact, I remember being in Mark's home last year, and Mark said, Joe, do you play chess? And I said, I do, actually. And he said, would you like to play my son? He's about this big. I said, I'd love to. <laughs> I wish I said no. <laughs> he beat me so fast. And I've played chess for since I was a, probably a, a young teenager. And I've actually played a grandmaster once in Michigan while I was growing up. So I've been with the game a long time. But this young man, Mark Erson's son, is brilliant and has been training with chess coaches, I heard, after he beat me for many years and probably will play grandmasters himself at the age of 12. It's just an amazing thing. But anyway, I'm kind of sidebarring already. Next week, Mark is going to be sharing with all of us the story of the Passover. The Passover, both in the Jewish world and the Christian world, as you all know, is one of the holiest and mightiest days of the year. We look at the Passover now on this side of the cross, and we see Jesus is our Passover lamb. Jesus fulfills the Passover for us and so on. Um, and Mark is going to be sharing this beautiful story from uh, the Hebrew word is the Haggadah. The Haggadah is translated as the telling. And basically it comes from um, the story of the Passover that is being told year after year after year. Every Passover, Jewish families will get together with their families and friends and they will share the story of the Passover and Exodus. If you've never done a Seder meal with a Jewish family, you owe it to yourself to do it before you go into glory. It, it will bless you beyond belief. So that's next Wednesday. We're going to get started at 6.30. Mark will come live just shortly after that. Now, you need to do something to be a part of this. You need to register. It's important that you register. And the reason you register is very simple. Mark Gerson just wrote his first book called The Telling, which is on the Passover. It just came out this week. It's in bookstores all across the United States and the world. And he is going to mail every single person who registers and hears his speech right here at Parkway. He's going to mail you a free copy of his 300-page hardbound edition book on the Passover. It's his gift to all of us. And so those of you that don't have internet and don't have computers, I'll register you tonight before you leave. And the rest of you, you're going to get the uh, information you need. I think the bulletin, it's gonna, some of it's going to be in the bulletin on Sunday. And we'll probably do an announcement as well just to make sure everybody's comfortable. And I'll stick around a little bit after service on Sunday and help you if you need help. Oh, beautiful. Pastor just said it's also on our Facebook page. So if you go to the Parkway Facebook page, you'll see all the information you need with a link. And all you do is hit the link, go to that, fill out your name, address, zip code. And then there's a drop down box. This is important now. It says uh, check your date and time. When you hit the drop down box, all these different churches that are a part of this are going to come up. Look for Parkway Church of God. Click on it. That way they'll know you'll be here next Wednesday night at 6.30. All right. It will be up hopefully tomorrow. Sorry, it's not up yet, but it will be up shortly. So, But we'll make sure all of you are registered hopefully by Sunday or Monday. Uh, we want you to come out. It's going to be a great, great time together. All right. We're talking about the Exodus, which, by the way, is I think I heard Pastor say it's one of his favorite books uh, in the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament, it certainly is one of mine. And uh, for most Jews, it is also uh, very much some of their favorites as well. There's so much information in this book, so much about God and his power and his deliverance out of Egypt. And we've really, we've discussed quite a bit. We've been spending some, some good time over the last several weeks. We've talked about the deliverance. 
um, of Moses leading, you know, the people out of Egypt. We've talked about the call of Moses as the deliverer. We talked about Moses the man, the fears that he went through, the all, all the things that you and I, when God calls us to do something, Lord, I don't feel adequate. I don't feel like I can do that. And Moses went through the same thing. We talked about the plagues of Egypt and what they represented and so forth. We talked, now we skipped over the Passover because next Wednesday night, we'll be discussing the Passover in detail with some of our Jewish friends. It's going to be wonderful. And then we talked about the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, and the song at the sea that was sung, and the manna, the quail, the... Uh, the war with Amalek and, and uh, Jethro giving advice to Moses, which was really good advice. And then we come now to the covenant at Sinai. And last week, Pastor did a great, great job talking about the 10 ways. Now, again, there's no, if, if I remember right, there is no word for command or commandment in Hebrew. And it's really translated the 10 ways. We call it the 10 commandments, which there's nothing wrong with that. But if you think about it, just give this a thought. Human nature, to me anyway, says if you tell me I have to do it, I sometimes put my back against the wall, don't you? If you tell me that there's no, you just have to do this, I get a little bit, you know, maybe rebellious. But um, isn't it just like God who said, listen, these are the ways to walk in. If you don't want to do it, fine, you suffer the consequences. But if you do it, you'll find the blessing of God associated with these, what we call commandments. So it just seems when I, when I heard that from a Jewish man that there really is no word for commandment um, and even obey. I heard Mark Gerson recently, we were doing a study and he said, there is no Hebrew word for obey. And, and the concept, he said, now I understand in the Christian world, we use that word a lot to obey, you know, is better than sacrifice and to be obedient and all that. But he said, there is no Hebrew word that translates that. And he said, in Hebrew, we understand it a little bit differently, where, where the Jews are not afraid, and I, I have to admit, I still don't know how I feel about this, and Mark might even teach on this next week, but... Um, the Jews love a good argument. Let me just say it the way the Jews will say it. They love a good argument. If you know any Jewish people, they love to argue. In fact, we were laughing one day. We were with a group of Jewish people, and that conversation came up, and I said, you know, I just I don't get it. I said, I've heard two Jewish men just uh, you know, almost in a knockdown, drag-out argument, and it's like the bell rings, and they put their arms around each other. They're brothers again, and they walk home, and, he said, and they laughed, and they said, Joe, that's just who we are. We like a good argument. We like the dialogue. We like the confrontation. We, we pull things out of each other. That's just how they're bred and raised. And, um, and he said, with God, God always expected his people, I hate to use the word argue, they will say ar to argue with him. I don't think I could even get those words out of my mouth. I don't think I could ever argue with God. But our Jewish friends will tell you they have a good argument with God. And God likes that, and God addresses it, and they start giving examples over and over, whether it's Abraham and, and you know, I'm going to destroy Sodom and, you know, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, but, you know, what if I can find 40 righteous? And the dialogue begins, and, and right through the entirety of the Hebrew Scriptures, there's always this dialogue that Jews had with God. And God seemed to welcome that. And, you know, he was never angry about it when people questioned. And I've heard, and I've preached it, I know Pastor has, God doesn't mind you questioning him. He's got big shoulders. He, can, he knows the answer, and he's going to give you the right answer. He doesn't mind the dialogue. So anyway, um, that's kind of, as we move on now, we're going to pick up right after the Ten Ways or the Ten Commandments, which were the moral and religious and ethical codes that God gave for us to live by. If we live by them, there's blessing. If you don't, and by the way, um, this is beautiful. I heard a pastor not long ago say, you know, you need to understand that in, in all of the scriptures, when God gives us uh, instruction and so forth to do certain things, they're usually, they usually have nothing to do with salvation, Salvation is accomplished through the person of Jesus. That's a done deal. All these other issues, these ways and these, you know, do this and you'll do this and you don't do this, you won't have this, 
those are the blessings of God that come on us as we do what God said to do. It doesn't mean you're not saved. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. You're saved by putting faith in him and nothing. You're not saved by doing the Ten Commandments. In fact, Paul made that very clear, didn't he? That was our school teacher to bring us to a place of faith where we understood we can't do it on our own. We need Messiah. And so we accept Jesus and so on. So all of the things that we're talking about are, are religious ordinances. They're, they're um, social codes. They're religious codes. They're um, um, codes that help us to understand uh, what is proper uh, uh, communication or proper um, conduct in our world and so forth. And that's where we're going to go tonight. So last week, Pastor discussed the Ten Commandments. Tonight, we're going to continue on with the covenant at Sinai as now we're moving into the laws, if you will, on, and I'm just going to go through this kind of quickly, but the laws on slaves, on homicide, on bodily injury, on property damage, on society, how we regulate ourselves in society, on justice, on being a good neighbor, and then finally, Exodus 23 concludes with sacred seasons that God expected us to to be a part of. So that's where we're going tonight. I hope, I, I think most of us, in the light of what's happening in our society right now, um, with what we're seeing, with what we're all facing, with the unrest, the civil unrest, the pain that's out there, uh, people are just unhinged, aren't they? They're, they're doing things that you, you know, I'm old enough now, I, I wouldn't brag about this, but I'm old enough now to look back on when I was a child and the way we kind of addressed even older adults. If I ever addressed an adult in a just a flippant way, I would have got backhanded. I mean, my dad would have backhanded me. There's no question. That's just how it was. Um, you said yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. We couldn't even, Kathy and I were talking about this the other night, we were watching something on TV, and it was neat because the young man sitting at a table said, may I be excused? And I, I started laughing. I said, oh my goodness, does that take me back? We could not leave the dinner table as a kid until we asked to be excused. And usually that involved an inspection of the plate to make sure we ate everything we were supposed to have eaten. And then you probably got, yes, you can be excused. We couldn't just get up. We'd never think of taking a phone. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back then. We had the old rotary dial things, you know. But um, it was just a different world. But today, we've come absolutely unhinged. So let's, let's delve into this tonight. We have about, oh, 35 minutes or so. Um, let's rediscover the fact that Israel, first of all, during this season in its life, was a theocratic run um, a, th a theocracy. It was run by God. God was the king, if you will. They didn't have a king. They had no legislatures. God was what they what it was all about. Nothing else. It's called the theocratic kingdom. God was their king. The laws that God gave at Sinai were designed to keep Israel in a place of balance with each other with nature, with him. You know, the, the older I get, the more I realize I, I, used, to, I used to fight a lot against things like, um, uh, you know, um, the, the balance in nature and stuff. I just always thought, you know, nature take care of itself. And I realized that, you know, nature to God is very important. God made it. And, and I, I'm glad we're finally waking up to the fact that we really should be somewhat concerned about what we do and how we do it and where we do it and what we're harming. And those are important things to God and they should be to us also. So God placed these laws into Israel's hands and they were, uh, they were not a part of a legislative body. Men didn't come up with these laws, these social laws and religious laws. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, talked about, voted on, and, and uh, you know, ratified, now we're going to do these things. It didn't work that way. God said, this is the way to live. And, and it might, if I can just sidebar, this is interesting to me. Do you realize in our Constitution and the founding of the American dream or the American society, this republic that we serve in and live in today, do you know most of the legislative laws that came to us came out of this book? The book of Exodus. 
It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I've been to the Supreme Court many, many times in my life. I've actually been privileged to go inside the court on one or two occasions. And do you know, if you go to the Supreme Court, what you're going to find is you're going to find these statues of individuals. And do you know who's right in the middle? Moses, the lawgiver. It's, it's just amazing. And, you, and I could go on and on and just give you history of our nation. But the truth is, these things that we will discuss over the next few moments literally became part of the fabric of American society. And it's because men who were somewhat smart realized God really did give the best way to go. So you'll find that in the justice system that men originate, laws and punishments have a tendency to wax and wane. And we've seen, in my lifetime, I've seen presidents come and go. I've seen legislators come and go. I, I've known over my lifetime many uh, United States senators. I've known many congressmen. I've been to both Senate and the Congress on many occasions. I have met senators and congressmen on the steps of the Capitol building. I used to take, I had a Christian school for many years, and I would take every year I and some of our staff would go with just our seniors. We'd take them to Washington. We'd always prearrange to meet with our Congress people and our senators. And, um, and, and we just, we kind of grew up with that. So we've always felt comfortable with that. But my point is this, the laws that are being made now are being made in a legislative body by men and women of various degrees and backgrounds and understandings and persuasions politi politically and so forth. and. And the, um, when the laws are passed, there is supposed to be, if you break those laws, there's consequences. And we've watched in all of our lifetime that the consequences to breaking the law, they almost don't mean a whole lot anymore. And I could spend a week uh, on this topic, and I believe that's one of the reasons why we are having the issues that we're having today without trying to get too political one of the reasons I believe, and it's probably one of the top reasons we're having so much trouble in our nation today, is we no longer uphold the laws of our land. We just don't punish, and I don't want you to think that I'm this kind of, you know, just I'm go get them and we need to punish them. And that, that's not what I'm saying. There has to be punishment for breaking laws. There has to be. And if we don't do that, what happens? You invite others to participate in those deeds, and they don't have a big problem with it because they know they can probably get away with it. And that's kind of where we are in our society. And we're seeing, we're just watching it crumble and come apart. So we need to somehow get back to God's economy, that laws were designed to be equitable and fair to all people. And punishment was designed for a twofold purpose. Number one, to punish the evildoer. And secondly, to be a deterrent to others not to commit the same crime. And we just don't do that hardly at all. Romans 13 is a very powerful teaching in just three short verses. In fact, I'm going to read it to you because it's so good. Now, remember, man is no longer living in our day and age under a theocratic kingdom. We remember Israel at one point, they saw the kings of other nations and they cried out to the Lord, give us a king. And God said, I, you know, I, I don't really think you want that. And No, we want a king. And God finally gave him a king. And of course, that was, that's where things started going wrong, unfortunately. Well, they're still going wrong in a lot of ways. But so nowadays... We, are under, we live under a system of governments. All people do, whether it's a, a republic like ours in America, and not too many republics are out there, to be honest. Most live under dictatorships and so on. But we all live, all people live under some form of government. Listen to Romans 13, starting at verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the higher authorities. Christians really need to pay attention to that. And I'm really preaching to myself now, and that goes to something as simple as wearing seatbelts, which I hardly ever, 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 ever put a seatbelt on. But you know what? It's the law. And I should be. It's for my own good. That law was passed to save lives. It was passed for a good reason. And so as a believer, when I read Romans 13, that says I have the obligation, according to this, 
My soul must be subject to the higher authorities, for there is no authority but of God, and the, the authorities that exist are ordained of God. That doesn't mean God approves necessarily of everything done in all those uh, government agencies. It just means you're living under that, and you have an obligation unless that government agency tells you you can't do something you know your faith tells you you must do. That's different. That's a different topic. But we're just talking about civil authority. So we have an obligation to uh, be subject to the higher powers. Verse 2, so that the one resisting the authority, the one who resists, the man who rebels, is resisting the ordinance of God, it says. And the ones who resist will receive judgment unto themselves. For the rulers, Paul said, the rulers are not a terror to good works. So in other words, government shouldn't be terrorizing people that are doing right or righteousness. And you can, again, you can see how things are beginning to change. You know, it's, it's kind of ironic. Somebody sent me during this whole COVID thing an airplane packed with people with masks on and a church building totally empty in California because a governor said, nah, -uh. you can fly on full airplanes. You cannot go to a church. And, and I'm really, I know pastors who have put their back against the wall and said, we're not shutting our church down. I think John MacArthur was one. Literally kept, and he's got a very large church in uh, Southern California, kept his church open the entire time. And if I heard right, um, they didn't social distance at all. And not one person, not one person, and I hope you can prove me wrong on this, but I, I think I heard John say this on an interview, not one person in the church ever got COVID. So, and, and I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not making arguments here, this is good, this is bad, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we have a responsibility to do what the government tells us to do unless the government crosses the line and tells us you cannot do what your faith demands you to do. So that, that's the difference. So let's move on. So rulers are not a terror to good works, but to bad. And do you desire to, uh, do you desire not to be afraid of the authority? Do you desire not to be afraid of the authority? Then do good, and you shall have praise from it. For the servant, listen to this, for the servant of God is to you for good. For if you practice evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword in vain. For it is a servant of God, a revenger of wrath on him who does evil. Now, I, I realize that many, we use this as an argument for capital punishment. If you ask me personally, I do personally, I do not have a problem with capital punishment. Um, if a person, you know, as long as the trial was fair and it wasn't just hearsay and the person did what, you know, they say he did or he admits to it, I have no problem with capital punishment. You murder somebody, you take their life. I don't have a problem with your life being taken. That's just, I believe that's very biblical in a lot of ways. Now, I know some pastors feel different. I don't even know how Pastor Philip feels on that. I didn't ask him, but, um, and I know everybody's different on this, but it says clearly, if you practice evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword in vain. There is punishment that is required for evildoers. So the covenant at Sinai addresses laws on slaves, on homicide, bodily injury, property damage, society issues, justice, proper neighbor relationships. It also addresses sacred seasons that were to be observed by the people of Israel. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Time will not permit us, of course, to cover any of these in great detail, but I'd like to spend just a few moments on each one and... Um, and these, these come from chapters 21 through 23, and just discuss them. And I, just a little bit of commentary. We're going to start with slaves, because it starts with slaves. Let me start by saying this. When it comes to the topic of slavery, um, I believe personally that slavery was never, ever a part of God's plan for mankind. Never. If you go back to the beginning, God made man in his own image. He loves everybody. Everybody, everybody was free. And as, as man progressed and, and so forth and became more powerful, um, man just does some unruly things. There's no doubt about it. Plus, plus, understand that we're 
dealing with a time in history that was very different. And moving just on a little bit more than that, understand that the word slave in your King James Bible does not always mean slave like we think of the term slave, like somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, there's a taskmaster who's beating somebody and making them do things. Because many of the times you read the word slave, it's really talking about a servant in your household and how you treat that servant and you don't treat them with, with disrespect and so on. So again, there's a lot of, a lot of issues in play here. Um, God's going to take care of the slavery issue soon. We're coming into an hour where they'll, they'll never be slaves again. By the way, this is horrifying to me, but I've heard this from numerous sources. There have never been more slaves on planet Earth than there is today. There's more people enslaved today than at any other time in human history. And that ought to give all of us cause for great concern. Um, there is a way to treat a servant if it's a, a servant of yours, and God lays that out very clearly, which we're going to deal with. So let's understand that this issue of slavery invokes very strong feelings and emotion, and understandably so. If I were African American, I can tell you I'd feel a whole lot different about slavery than me being white. I get that. I have a lot of African American friends, a lot of pastor friends, and we discuss at length these issues. And it's so good to see God at, in this hour um, taking pastors of black and white churches and bringing them together and dialoguing and talking about issues that are important to the black community and the white community. And we're seeing some of the most wonderful things, healing that is coming out of this. It's just absolutely amazing. So strong feelings, no question. Um, but please understand, slaves or servants have always been a part of the economy of civilizations, always. Go back to almost the beginning of time. Uh, even Israel themselves understood this because they were slaves themselves. They were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves in other cultures that, that took them into slavery. And I, and I mean real slavery, not servants, slaves, where they were building for Pharaoh his cities, and they were under great oppression and, and beatings and, and so forth. So this is why, now understand this, this is why God in numerous places, including Leviticus 19.34 and many others, let me read that to you, but the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one who is born among you. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers yourselves in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So God says, don't treat anybody with, with um, you know, discontent or with, with uh, anger or just understand you were slaves once and you need to understand how you felt so you don't treat others the same way. And boy, that's, that's a lesson for all of us. So is slavery or, or servant, is that God's highest? Absolutely not. And I, again, I don't believe he ever planned that originally. I believe people were not to be slaves. And one day, all of this will be set right again. No question about it. God will deliver all peoples. Now, the Lord, what he does do is ensure the proper treatment of individuals who serve others. They were not to be mistreated. They, in today's world, as I just mentioned, there are more slaves than any other time. A tragic reminder to the evil intent of men to control and manipulate others for their own gain. That's what slavery is all about. It's manipulating and making people do things for someone else's gain. And that is always wrong. Is it wrong to have servants? No. I don't believe it is. I, I know people that are very, very wealthy that have servants that um, love them, serve them faithfully for many, many years. They clean their homes. They cook their meals. They take care of their children when they're not. All kinds of things. And they're compensated very well. And they have their own quarters and all of that. I think that was more of what Israel was, was really supposed to be dealing with. If you have a servant by the way, the Bible says that after serving you for six years, you let them go. They go free. You don't keep a human being. That's not what God's plan was and so forth. Okay, so I, I hope we covered that. Again, we could spend months and months on the topic of slavery. It's very deep. It's very painful. It, it's just not right. It really isn't. But God 
made sure that Israel understood the depth of pain that people feel if they're a servant or a slave, and you make sure you treat them with respect and so forth. All right, so that's, one, that's the first law. Secondly, he goes on to homicide, the killing or murder of another human being. I know the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. I understand that that should be translated more correctly, thou shalt not commit murder. And when you shed innocent blood, you have just stepped on God's law. And God is uh, he's not happy with that. Let me just say it that way. The reason does not matter if you're jealous. And people do crazy things out of jealousy. And they murder because they're insanely jealous. Or, or hatred. That's why I'm so glad our pastor talk so often on these kinds of issues of jealousy and hatred and, and what they do to us. They infect us with a horrible disease, and we do things that usually we're sorry for later on, and sometimes they can't be undone, unfortunately. Whatever the cause, God deals very directly with a man or a woman who murders another. Very simply, he said, life for life. Life for life. If you take somebody's life, you lose yours. And uh, that's a good deterrent to murder, isn't it? Can you imagine if societies around the world today, if we just punish the evildoers um, with, a, with a righteous punishment? I mean, you don't, obviously, you don't kill somebody who stole a pack of gum from a store. But, you know, the, the judgment part of it has to be commensurate to what the person did. So if we are, if you take somebody's life, um, in today's society, you could be out of jail in three or four or five years, six years, seven years, you're back on the streets again. Or in some cases, amnesty and you're back on the street one year after you murdered somebody and they do it again. How many times have we heard that in just the last couple of years? There's something wrong with a society that does not follow God's laws. And when you don't punish the evildoers, as we said at the very beginning, you create an opportunity for others to join in the same activity, thinking, I can probably get off in two or three years. It'll be worth it. It's not a big deal. But if you're going to the electric chair or, or you're getting a needle in your arm and you're not coming out of that, um, you think twice about it, don't you? Without a doubt. I mean, that's just common sense. So I'm not here to make a case for capital punishment one way or another. That's not what I'm saying. I will say this. If we held men to a higher standard and we punished the evildoer, we would have far less murder or far less crime, period. And again, the punishment needs to fit the crime. Let's talk about bodily injury, something that is going on everywhere today. The Lord was very clear. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You hurt or damage another, the punishment, the punishment will fit the pain inflicted on that individual. You're going to get the same inflicted on you. Now, of course, we don't do that in our society today, and I'm not advocating that we should, you know, knock somebody's eye out who knocks somebody else's eye out, but I am saying if you do that, there needs to be punishment for it, not just a slap on the wrist and, and sent back on the street. When I see total disregard for others in our society, which we're seeing today, I'm very much concerned that we have invited violence to escalate in our land as we no longer punish those who are causing bodily violence to people. Uh, God's going to help us, I'm sure. We just got to get back to a place where we really recognize how important it is to treat everyone with respect. Doesn't matter who they are, what their backgrounds are, what their ethnicity is, the color of their skin. Listen, you've heard this before a hundred times, and we've all said it. When all men are cut, we bleed red. That's men or women, of course. We all bleed red. We're human beings. And to, to treat somebody with contempt because they talk differently or have an accent like Maria has or the color of their skin is different or when we start treating each other badly, um, what are we saying? That we are superior to them? And that's just, that's ridiculous. And that's why God said bodily injury, if you inflict something on someone else, it's coming back on you. And again, if we, if we can just get our legislators to finally, you know, just say, let's do this thing right, I think we see a whole lot less violence 
I, I don't know if you heard, there's a, a story out there right now that um, one of our government agencies picked up an email or picked up something that there's going to be an attack tomorrow on our capital. And so now they've, they're ramping up, they're bringing police back in. I'm not sure if the National Guard's coming back or not, but everyone's concerned. And I heard Congress decided not to come to work tomorrow. They've closed down Congress tomorrow because they've heard about this potential attack on our, on our nation. You know what? If we made an example of the people that have been arrested and charged after the January 6th attack, I mean, if we really kind of put the screws down and put them in jail for a long time, wouldn't you think twice about going back and doing something again when you know you're not going to get away with it? I mean, again, that's, that's just where we need to go, and it comes right out of God's book. And I'll leave that to the legislators and the lawmakers, the punishment and stuff. I'm not advocating for any kind of punishment, but, but I'm advocating for some kind of punishment that needs to take place. Property damage. Let's talk about that quickly. Uh, do you remember, are you old enough to remember watching the old westerns where somebody rustled up somebody's cow and they would hang you. <laughs> I mean, you stole my cow, you're dead. You, you got hanged. <laughs> yeah, that's right, in public, yeah. Um, again, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying, now hear me, this is important. Because to God, it's very important. Your property is sacred to you and to God. You worked hard for that. You bought that. You labor at that property. Nowadays, we have people committing B&Es everywhere. They're breaking into people's house. They get caught. They don't even go to jail. Um, I would just say this. If somebody breaks in my house, they are in for a very rude awakening. They may not wake up again. I'm not sure. But, but your property is sacred. And, and it needs to be treated that way. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, and I haven't looked this up in a long time, the castle doctrine, which I think is still in effect, that your home is your castle, and nobody has the right to enter your home that you don't invite them in. That's a law of the land in all of America, all 50 states. So, again, if we just really understood... If somebody's damaging my property, <laughs> I just, I don't even want to say what I'm thinking, but I'm not going to say it. Um, and, and, you know, there's another side to this. Your property is where your most valued possessions are, your family. If somebody's breaking into your home, if you're a husband, you're going to protect your wife and children, without a doubt. You're not going to let some, some maniac do damage to your family. You just won't do that. And God has a whole section in this law at Sinai on property damage. If you damage somebody's property, if you steal somebody's property, if you enter somebody's property, God says you are, you're going to pay it back with interest. Um, and depending on what you did, it, it could be a whole lot more severe than that as well. We just got to get back to doing the right things again. We got to get back and, you know... We got to get back to start training our young people in America that it's you respect other people's property. My dad, when I was a kid, if I walked on somebody's grass, I grew up in Michigan. If I walked down the sidewalk and I walked on somebody's grass, I got it because that wasn't my grass to walk on. And if our dog did his business on somebody's grass, you better clean it up. You don't leave it there and keep walking. You don't do that. So I was taught, and many of you were, there's a respect for other people's property. If I get out of my car at a supermarket and somebody's like, parks real close to me, listen, I've never, I've seen people, I've seen them with my eyes, get mad because somebody parked close to them, take their car door and shove it into the car next to them. I won't even tell you. I'm not going to tell you what I'm thinking there either. <laughs> um, but I make sure that I never, ever open my car door and touch somebody else. I don't care how close they are. I'm not going to hit their car. I, to me, that is a, that's a major purchase. I know how people feel about their cars, and they take care of them and clean them, and they want them on the road as long as you can. I'm not going to damage somebody's car. But there's far too many people that don't care. 
Just look, walk through the church parking lot, look at all the dings in people's doors. That should not happen. I know I'm getting a little <laughs> meddling here a little bit, but, and not that anybody's done that to me because I, I try to park like in the back of the lot somewhere where there's nobody around. Uh, but property, your property is important, and you have a right to protect it. You have a right to protect your family. God says so, and most, in most societies, they say so as well. Let's talk about society rules just for a moment. This is all right out of the scriptures. Proper conduct between men and women. We could spend a month on this one. <clears throat> There's all kinds of things. All you got to do is turn the news on and watch what's going on with Governor Cuomo up in New York right now. Um, I tell you, it's just too frequent. It's just too frequent. What gives a man, any man, I don't care how powerful, I don't care if you're president, what gives a man the right to think he can take advantage of anyone else? You know what the problem is? They don't have the foundation they need to have that certain things are off limits. You don't do that. And unfortunately, power, I think was it Churchill or someone who said absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, I realize when you get in positions of power and authority, you think you can take advantage of others, but truly you can't. You can't because God said you can't. There are societal rules that we must follow. Sexual impurity is one of them God mentions in this chapter that we're discussing right now. Um, religious impurity was the next thing. If you continue reading down in Exodus, you shall not go after other gods. You shall not worship other gods. You shall not make idols. You shall not do these things because he's a jealous God. You don't do that. And we, listen... I know we don't live in an hour where we go to the local store and buy idols. I get that. <clears throat> but boy, do we, we, have, we do our share of idol worship. We just don't realize it. Yeah, Robbie, you're right. I mean, it could be our cell phones, our computers. It could be football. It could be, it could be anything that you just put to a place in your life that is more important than God is. It's an idol. And, and the church has really got to start tearing those idols down. None of those things may be bad in themselves. It's how we interact and dialogue and put them in a position they don't belong. Idolatry. Uh, proper treatment of strangers. God says it again. We have lost the art of hospitality. We've lost that art. Um, Mark Gerson, in one of his teachings on uh, the Passover, he, he shares quite a in fact, I told him just last week, he and I were co-hosting an event, and I said, you know, Mark, I said, I have to be honest with you, um, I, I was so taken back and so moved by your teaching on hospitality, because I don't do a lot of those things that you're talking about, and I know I should. We don't entertain people like we should. We don't treat people like we should. And I said, Mark, please help us, because we're living in a society that is a little bit frightening at, at times. And he said, how, I said to him, how can we open our doors to people we don't know? And he said, that's a really good question. And he said, I don't know if I can answer that completely, but I'll, I'll share this with you. I just heard this today on the news, he said. And Mark said he is watching the ice storm and snowstorm that hit Texas, and a delivery driver, I think it was UPS or FedEx, um, got stuck in the snow at somebody's house. He delivered a package, and the lady of that house and her husband said, listen, you can't get your truck out. It's getting late. It's dark. It's very cold. Spend the night at our home. And she opened the home up, which was wonderful. And he said, that is what the Bible is talking about, being hospitable. We, and, and again, most of us don't do anything like that anymore. But boy, we should. We should. We should, if you see somebody on the side of the road that's broken down. Now, if you're a lady alone, don't do this. That's not what I'm saying. Don't do that. Uh, but if you're a man and you see somebody, their car broke down, I always try to stop and make sure they're all right. Can I help you? Do you need a jump? What, I mean, what's the problem? Can I call somebody for you? Most people have cell phones, but you never know. So just be hospitable. And, and Mark said... I don't know if you realize it, but God places a premium on hospitality beyond what most Jews and Christians even realize. It's very, very high on his list. 
When Abraham saw, and he used this as an illustration, when Abraham saw the angels that were coming toward him, that were going to talk to him about Sodom and Gomorrah, you're, you know the story. What does it say he did? He was sitting in the door of his tent. What did he do? He ran to them and said, come to my tent. Wash your feet. My wife's going to prepare a meal. And he said, that's how we try to live. On the Passover, every Jewish family will literally go out of the way and look for somebody that is not a part of their family and invite them to Passover meal. And I thought, man, that's great. We ought to be doing that for Thanksgiving. We ought to be, you know, it, and just getting to fellowship with people and know people. All right, anyway, we gotta, we got to wind this down. We're going to be on time. So society rules. There's a whole bunch of them there. You can read it and you can learn. Justice and being a good neighbor has to do with honesty and proper treatment of others. Don't lie. Don't bear false witness. Help your neighbor. If his animal has gone astray, help him find it and get it back home. And it goes on and it says, don't take bribes from anyone because a bribe, an expensive gift, a kickback, will pervert justice, and it does. Don't take a bribe. These are, all, these are all common sense, great things that God said, if you live this way, you'll be blessed. Justice should be blind. Justice should be blind. It must do the right thing all the time, regardless of who it is, how rich they are, what they own, color their skin, all that Justice, no way. Justice is justice. Let's do it right. And then I close with sacred seasons. These were religious responsibilities. Letting the land rest on the seventh year. Keeping the Sabbath every week. Going to Jerusalem on the feast days. And, and I just want to say as I close, oh, I pray the church gets back to, to an understanding of how, how, how important it is that we do some of these things again. You know, we're living in a moment in church history, even, certainly in America, where, I don't know, Passover, Lent, Christmas, Easter, it's just another day. I've heard good Christians say that, and I just like, really, it's just another day? It's not just another day. It's a day we observe something very important on God's calendar. That's why the Passover is the longest running religious rite in the history of planet Earth. It's been repeated year after year since the Passover. Every single year for thousands of years, the Passover is still being celebrated. Why? Because it puts us in remembrance of God and what he's done for Israel. And brother, sister, it is so important. Uh, you know, I just learned something the other day, watch night. I don't, I don't know if you've had watch night services. Years ago, we all had them. And I never knew this. All the year, I, I had a watch night service every year for 20-something years. I just thought it was a way to bring in the new year. You know what I found out? Watch night was started by Abraham Lincoln because the slaves were freed at midnight on January 1st, December 31st, January 1st. And the black church observed watch night as a remembrance of being freed as a slave. And I said, I said to this person, I said, oh, my God, all those years I had a watch night service. Had no idea. I wish I knew that simple fact because it would have made the celebration more rich. Just think of, of what you could talk about on a night like that, being freed. God, want, who knows what that was? God wants us to... Uh, remember those special days. We need to be in church. We need to celebrate together. We need to hear pastor talking about those events and how important they are to us to remember what our God has done for all of us. I'm done. Pastor, take over, please. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Joe. We sure do appreciate this word tonight and Wow, it's been rich. Uh, I think you preached me under conviction. <laughs> so it's so true. Even in the even in the New Testament, um, I think it's the book of Hebrews it says, "Be careful to entertain strangers, because some 
have unknowingly entertained angels. And so uh, that's, that's such an important thing to do. And all of the other things you talked about as well. Um, I think uh, what I usually say is it's been a good Sunday if I preach myself under conviction. So thank you so much, Joe, for challenging us all tonight to relook at our lives and examine our actions and uh, take stock of where we are. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we are looking forward not only to Sunday, but we are looking forward to next Wednesday with Mark Gerson. And uh, I am so excited about him joining us. And by the way, I don't know if you may have already said this, Joe, but this session is going to be just with Parkway folks and Mark. So there's, all, there's a bunch of churches all around the world that have their own sessions. But this session is going to be just for us. And it's so exciting to have him uh, take the time to just, just be with us. And so uh, I would encourage you to uh, perhaps tomorrow when we get it up on the fa- our church Facebook page, all the, how to log in and register, uh, especially for those who are going to join us remotely. And uh, also, you can join us here live, and we're hope, hoping to have Mark on the big screens and uh, hoping for that to all work out. And so, uh, we'll provide this uh, information as well on Sunday so that you can have plenty of time to get registered and to sign up for your free book as well. So, this is so exciting. Thank you so much, Joe, for for bringing Mark to us next Wednesday, and it's, it's going to be a wonderful time together. All right. Well, it's, it has been good to have been in the house of the Lord tonight. Again, let me say thank you, Joe. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you all here. Thank you all who've joined us via live stream, via the conference line. Hey, have a blessed, wonderful week in the Lord. Shalom.